Well, welcome once again to Voice of Reason Radio. Your host, Chris Honholtz and Richard Story, joining you on this 17th of December, 2022. Very, very close to the end of the year. I'm going to have to start learning to say 2023, and I'm probably going to end up editing many episodes over the following weeks for getting to say it the right way. So but we are getting very close to the end of this year, and we have been grateful that so many of you have uh, been with us throughout the course of 2022. It has been a very interesting ride. I think maybe the last episode of the year, maybe we'll we'll talk about some of that. Uh, just by the way, next week, just to give you a heads up, we won't be here with a new episode because... Because like you, we're going to spend time with our families and uh, we're going to be you know, doing things, ser- uh, church services, church worship, spending time with our families, having meals and fellowship. And so we will have an episode if you guys would like to you know, be able to continue to tune in. Uh, we encourage you to share that with other folks who haven't heard it before. Uh, we have a, a, a Christmas episode that we've done a couple years back. Probably share that one again for you, uh, for you all. And hopefully that will be edifying to you and it will be something you can share with others, pointing them back to Christ. That's what we hope to do with that particular one. Uh, But we are rapidly closing in on that date and we hope that all of you, first and foremost, remember that while American culture, and by the way, if you're listening from somewhere else, this we are based in America, so a lot of things we talk about happen to be within our cultural norms, so bear with us, that's just, <laughs> it's where most of our audience is, uh, but cultural Christianity, cultural Christmas, it has a lot of nostalgia, has some some great songs, and some really terrible songs, wham, really, and, and it, do we really need to hear Mariah Carey 16 times in an hour please radio stations and and by the way the songs about people are starving in africa so how dare you have christmas really do do, do you really really need to play that song again you just played it like 10 minutes ago you gotta you gotta do it again huh putting all that aside (laughs) i understand that there's a lot of cultural trappings there's a in fact there's a lot of um materialistic trappings there are a lot of um really even anti-christian trappings that come with the cultural celebration of, of christmas and and that can be problematic in a lot of ways and so we need to keep those in mind but at the same time while there's no command for us to celebrate christmas in scripture there's no feast or festival that we're called to celebrate the idea that we are celebrating the incarnation the most amazing miracle that god took on human flesh May that be at the center of your conversations and your fellowship and the time with your family. What better time to bring about the discussion of Jesus Christ coming to earth, taking on human flesh, to be our representative, to live the lives that we could not live, to die the death that we all deserve, to and then later rise from the grave. What a perfect opportunity to proclaim the gospel message. So may that be at the center of all you do as as we are winding down this particular year and we're coming into these these final days before the Christmas celebration here. So always as always want to remind you, we are part of the Christian Podcast Community. Please check out all the, the, the wonderful podcast programs on there. You will find something great to listen to. While we greatly appreciate your taking time to listen to us, we understand you have a limited time to spend listening to podcasts. Unless you're like James White, who listens to things at like 1.5 or 2.0 speed. And by the way, Dr. White, happy 60th birthday. God bless you. We are so grateful for what you do in service to the Lord. But unless you're as crazy as him and listen at chipmunk speed, which I do not want to think what you and I sound like at chipmunk speed, Rich. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Unless you're one of those crazy people. Even if you find something else and you feel like, but I don't know what to listen. Look, if it's going to bless you and if it's going to edify you and you can't listen to us, but you listen to something else, don't worry. (laughs) God gives us listeners. We're not going to panic. We want you to be edified. So if you find another program on the podcast, uh, Christian Podcast Community, that blesses you even more, go for it. You have our blessing in that regard. Um, Also, SlaveToTheKing.com. That's our website. That's how you can reach out to us. That's how you can follow and get the newest program uh, updates, the newest blog updates as we occasionally get around to writing. Um, encourage you to sign up for that. And of course, ha- the, the 
you can how you can support the program in a variety of ways. So putting that all out there, getting that out in front so that we can get back to what we did last week. Uh, before we do that, how you doing this week, Rich? As always, brother, better than I deserve. And um, you were wishing Dr. White a happy birthday. Um, there's not many men, much less 60 years old, that would celebrate their birthday doing, <laughs> a, what, 6,000 feet ascend on a bicycle? That's what he did. Now, he does that... Um, virtually so to speak he he has a stationary bike set up and he's got this really sophisticated program thing that he hooks into and and it elevates and lowers and 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 he just cranks out so, so while well, all of us relax on our birthdays dr white's trying to i don't know kill himself i i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but he's different man that dr white so <laughs> yeah, I, I thought that was pretty cool uh uh, I, I saw that on Twitter today where he had posted about his birthday bike ride. And I was like, okay, that's definitely different. Oh, yes. He has, he's a different man. <laughs> I, I'm thinking if we could, if you, I, and he could all get together in one room, we'd probably get along pretty good because I think all three of us are wrapped just a little bit strangely <laughs> in some ways. I think you're probably correct on that. <laughs> I think you're very correct, in fact. <laughs> All right, well, brother, let's let's do a quick recap because we still got a lot of territory to cover. We're going to do a quick recap and kind of lay a roadmap so you guys know what's going to go with the rest of this particular episode. This is a follow-up to last week's episode, which was entitled, I Can't Support a Theology That... Dot, dot, dot. And this, of course, was referencing Dr. Beth Allison Barr, who basically had posted, I can't support a theology that doesn't center women and doesn't allow them to preach. And so what we did last week, I'm just going to briefly touch on this, is we started with what a lot of Pope, uh, excuse me, I can't speak correctly, what a lot of people try to do when they're talking about an egalitarian view of the pastorate. Well, here's all these places in the Bible that say women can preach. And we went through these various, uh, these, these various women in the Bible, and we talked about what the Bible says that they actually did and what it didn't say, and what that actually meant. So if you haven't listened to the episode, put it. I'll put it in the show notes. Stop this right now, because if you don't listen to that, the rest of this is going to be seem a little off kilter, because you're going to be like, well, what about all this other stuff? Go back and listen to that. <laughs> really encourage you to do so. Uh, and then we talked about one other important aspect of what every one of these godly women did, which was that they lived in radical obedience to to God. They did what God said, specifically what God said. They didn't reach beyond and go outside the lane of what God gave them to do. And what they did do is that they told people to be obedient to God's commands. So in each one of those instances, you don't what you don't have is what egalitarians are telling you. The egalitarians are telling you, well, this is evidence that what Paul talked about over here, which we'll get to tonight, can't really mean what it says, because this is evidence that they didn't do that, except that it's actually contradictory to that. It actually says that they did exactly what God told them and did not go beyond anything that God authorized them to do. So really encourage you, like I said, if you have not listened to that, please go back. It's not that we're trying to get more numbers for the episode. We just want you to, to have that backdrop. Tonight, we're going to talk about the uh, the uh, the uh, the standards of what scripture calls for when it talks to about the role of the pastorate, the role of men and women in the church. And then Rich has got some very, a real deep dive on the history of the city of Ephesus where Timothy was, a, uh, was the uh, preacher in the church. And this gives us a backdrop to Paul's instructions. Now, that backdrop, a lot of people, and Rich will get into this, will try to say, well, see, that's why it's only about that church and only applies there. But as we'll get into, there's actually more at stake. And what, there's a reason why this has application to the church all throughout history. So we're going to go into that. And hopefully what we're when we wrap this up tonight, what we'll be able to show you is that when you have someone like a Dr. Beth Allison Barr, um, she's blocked me on Twitter. This was well before we ever got to this. Uh, she's blocked a lot of people that disagree with her. Um, but when you have someone like her, they're adding into externals, they're taking those external belief systems and adding them in. And then they want you to say, they want you to believe that scripture doesn't really believe, say what it says. 
And so now you have to accept what they've added into it. What we want to be able to do for you, and hopefully with the last episode, and we'll do that with this episode, is remind you that God's word is complete. From Genesis to Revelation, it has a consistent message. And though there, while there are those who want to pick and choose or import different thinking and then reinterpret what Scripture says, you can be confident that the Scriptures themselves, for if you read them in context, especially when you have the historical backdrop and knowledge of those things, you can be even more aware and more confident in the Word of God, and you don't have to worry when someone like a uh, with a PhD next to their name, piled high and deep, uh, can can tell you, oh no, that's not what it means. The, the the Word of God is inspired, inerrant, and boy, that's 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 something I've seen on Twitter lately. Boy, the the uh, the anti inerrantists are very up in arms lately. <laughs> um, but it's inspired, it's inerrant, it's infallible, and it is all sufficient. And this is what you this is what you need in your walk as a Christian, and this is what you need to proclaim to people who are not walking in the faith. So, Rich, before we start diving in, any thoughts before we go forward? Well. Um... We have done absolutely zero research into tonight's episode. I mean, <laughs> nothing whatsoever. I'll, I'll touch on. I'll touch on that a little bit later in my in my segment. But um, just for full disclosure, before we even go any further, most, with the exception of this first segment with Chris, I will say this at this point: the research that was done in regards to the city of Ephesus. It pulled not only from biblical scholars, it also pulled from sources outside of Scripture. It pulled from sources that would have been what we would call secular society, archaeology, sociology, feminist, lesbian theology, um, homosexuals. So it, 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 before someone tries to say, well, you're just basing all of this on what these mean-spirited Patriarchal Christians have had to say, I'm just going to tell you right now, no, I'm using information or we will be using information provided by, for lack of a better word, information provided by the enemy itself. So yeah. maybe that's a little teaser to <laughs> keep people tuned in as we go forward. Other than then, I will ask now, people, please exercise a little grace with me tonight. Sometimes... <laughs> I, I can say these words in my head, but, but the, the transmitter between my brain and tongue, sometimes my tongue does not want to bend in certain directions like it should when it comes to pronouncing, especially some of these old Greek and Roman names and, and Latin and things. So I just be forewarned. I, I may, be, may be a little bit tongue-tied from time to time, and I think sometimes Chris catches that because you kind of had a little trouble there earlier yourself. But, um. <laughs> yeah, no, that and, and and by the way, Andrew, if you want to have outtakes for your your uh, collection of, of sound bites, I guess what this would be the episode to listen to on. So, <laughs> all right. So with all that as uh, as the foreground, let's go ahead and and pick up where we left off. Like we said. Last week we, we were talking about these these were women who lived in radical obedience to God. They they proclaimed specifically what God said. They they never spoke in contradiction to His word. They never reached beyond what God had given them to do. And they each glorified God Himself. They were not looking for recognition for themselves. So let's talk about the the actual prohibitions and the standards for the position of. Uh, a role of pastor or preacher uh, in the church. And we're going to go to 1 Timothy. This is the one that everybody's going to understand. Uh, they've heard this before, and this is the one that's going to make a lot of egalitarians very upset. But this is what Scripture actually says. So we'll start in chapter 2 of 1 Timothy, and we're going to start in verse 8. Paul writes, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for, a woman who profess, for women who profess godliness with good works. So let me just stop right there real quick. God is give, or Paul is giving instructions for both men and women in the church. 
This is not simply an effort to control women. Men and women have to exercise certain amount of control. Men are to pray, lifting their holy hands, and they are to be absent of what? Anger or quarreling. Okay? So, Men are to be humbled. I mean, what, what we want to get into arguments. We want to get into fights. We, we want to talk about how terrible things are. We, we want things our way. Yet, what are we called to do? Humble submission of prayer. All right? That we are to lift holy hands. And then women have specific instructions. Rich, some of the things, you, you sent me your notes. Some of the things that were specifically addressed here, Rich has some backdrop on, so I'm going to leave that to him. But understand, there are instructions for both Per, uh, both genders, and notice I only said both. I didn't say 72. Both genders, men and women, uh, in the church. So Paul is not exercising any kind of sexist mentality here. Let's just establish that first. So picking back up, verse 11, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. This is of something that goes back to actually 1 Corinthians 14.34. We'll get into that a little bit later. But this idea of learning uh, it, with all submit, submissiveness, I want you to understand something. And again, I, I know Rich will touch on this too. What is this different than? You know, we are talking about a period in time. If you, you know, if you come from the Jewish hierarchy or other cultural hierarchies, Women were second class. A lot of times they weren't allowed to learn. A lot of times they weren't allowed to be in the same room where men were learning. The, the, here they are in the body of Christ learning together. And they are learning quietly with all submissiveness. Verse 12, I do not permit a woman to, uh, to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Now, what's happening here? is you are seeing specific instructions that are being given to women about the authority to preach and teach inside the church. Okay, Who's given authority? It is not the women in the church. That has actually been denied to them. Why? For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness and with self-control. So we have these instructions. That men are to pray and they're not to demonstrate anger or quarreling attitude. That women are to adorn themselves respectfully with modesty and self-control, not a drawing attention to themselves outwardly, but demonstrating godliness and uh, through her good works. Women are, they have this, you know, men and women both have a role in the church as they're there, they're learning. But Paul is now trying to establish that, you know, and Rich, I can't wait till you get into this because this is going to really <laughs> blow a lot of people's minds. But there is a there's a backdrop to this uh, uh, this culture that they're in, and this idea of learning submissively. Okay, you're going to see something about that that's really going to be. It was a lot of stuff that Rich threw at me throughout the week. I'm like, wow, there was a lot going on there. But he's giving the women there some instructions. You're not going to take control. You're not going to be the ones to teach and preach. You're not going to be, you're going to come in and you're going to learn because you have certain things that God wants you to do. But the one thing you're not going to be able to do is step up and take authority. Then, uh, and then he ties it back to creation. Now, this is what we were getting at. You're going to hear a lot from Rich tonight about what the cultural backdrop of Ephesus was, where Timothy was pastoring. But Paul, in this moment, doesn't, or doesn't say, by the way, Ephesus, since you're dealing with this cultural issue, therefore the women there can't do this. Rather, he says, because Adam was formed first, then Eve. What, what is that telling us? That God at creation established a, a, a certain roles for men and women. Man was given dominion over the earth. He was, he was made first and given dominion over the earth. A woman was created to be his helpmeet, to come alongside and support him. What happened in creation, or following creation? We had the fall. What happened in the fall? Eve, being deceived, took the lead and ate of the fruit, and Adam failed to exercise dominion, failed to lead, and willfully... Adam was not deceived. Understand that. There's nothing here about Adam was not deceived, therefore he's not... You know, uh, he's He's... 
there's no big deal with him. Eve was deceived and she's really the bad one. No, Eve was deceived, but Adam willfully sinned. Okay, so two major failures here. And the lion's share falls on Adam because Adam should have been leading. He should have taken dominion over the, uh, you know, as he had been uh, instructed to do. He should have been leading his wife as he was instructed to do. He should have rebuked the snake in the name of God. But uh, the serpent, did he do any of those things? No, he willfully abdicates his position. His wife takes the lead. She is deceived. She gives him the fruit. He willfully eats. We have a flipping of the order of creation there. God, you know, what God had called them to do, they flipped over and did wrong. So he points it back to that. If you do in the church where what God has said not to do, in other words, women, you take up that role of leadership and authority, you are making the error that Eve made. Men, if you fail to lead, you may commit the same error of Adam. You fail to lead. Okay, so he takes it back to creation. And then he says that... Um, you know, the, but women will not bear this stigma eternally because they have been given something that the man does not have, and that is the ability to carry children. So if you continue in the faith and love and holiness, your stigma of Eve is, is taken. He wants, to, he wants women to understand. Just because you can't be in this position of leadership because God has created a role, and just because Eve sinned, even though she was deceived, she sinned, that stigma is taken away because God is giving you something beautiful and precious in this role of, of womanhood. And if you continue in love and faith and self-control, that is removed from you. You are saved from that. Okay? So this is the first thing we're looking at. It is this idea that women still have a role in the church. They're there learning with the men. They're not second-class citizens. They're not being denied understanding and knowledge. They are simply being said there is a role to be played by everybody here. And you don't get to you you can't take that step above and, re, and and make the same mistake as Eve. You have to be in this position that God has given you and men you have to take your position and you cannot willfully sin against God and abdicate it. Now, with regard to the standards of a pastor, what is what does Paul then say to Timothy? We go to chapter 3 verse 1. The saying is tr is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. To to want to step into that role, by the way, a very humbling role. This is not a spotlight role. This is not the this is the, not the highest of the high celebrity role. This is the ultimate servant's role. Remember what Jesus said about being a servant, you know, or to being a leader. It's not like the world leads. It's not ruling and reigning over people. Rather, it is to be the chief servant. All right? You are the chief servant in that role. Uh, verse 2, Therefore, an overseer, uh, or as we would see, a bishop or uh, a, a pastor, preacher, therefore, an overseer must be... Uh, I want you to pay attention to this. This is why when we point out, by the way, most men can't be in this role. This is why. The overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. So think about the various things you must be. Men, if you want to aspire to this role, this is the list of things you have to actually to be. You can't just be someone who can talk and have knowledge. Look, I'm a blabbermouth, okay? You, you get me walk, you get me talking, I love to hear the sound of my own voice. But that doesn't mean that just because I can make a cogent sentence or an argument that I'm qualified to be a pastor. Okay? Most men today who are in the role of pastor should not be pastors because they do not meet these qualifications. To be above reproach. In other words, 
It's not that you are perfect in all things, but you live your life in such a way that everyone can see it and you have not brought a reproach upon the name of Christ. Recently, we saw with a, a particular pastor, and I, I don't want to get into, uh, you know, into the 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 issues of it, but there was a pastor who um, he was called to step down because because he was engaging in inappropriate words of. I don't want to say this because I don't want to sound salacious. Matt Chandler was having discussions with a woman online in a very inappropriate manner. That's what we know. There seems to be more to the story, but we haven't been uh, 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 given all of that. But what we now know is Matt Chandler is no longer above reproach because even the modern secular media has caught on to this and is speaking about the things that he's alleged to have done. That's the idea of being above reproach. The, the world can't look at you and go, you know, you're this and this and this, and look what you've done, and, now, and they're going to elevate you to pastor? Now, mind you, the world will find reasons to do that anyway, but you understand my point, that they're, they're, you are living your life in such a way that people recognize the way you speak, the way you live, the way you think, the way you act, are consistent with what the Word of God says. You're the husband of one wife. This is going to get me in trouble with some folks, but I'm gonna, here's how I'm going to say it. Well, Every qualification I believe here in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7 is your post-conversion. Because none of us, no man would be qualified. John MacArthur would never be qualified to preach if we evaluated him from anything he did before he came to Christ. I believe this has everything to do with post-conversion. Husband of one wife, look, if in your, pre, in your pre-Christ days, you got married early, divorced later... I don't think this has any application. This is going to get somebody upset with me. I just know it. Um, in fact, I can hear the person typing the keys now. Um, but husband of one wife, post-conversion, you've been married. You're not to be divorced. You're not to have engaged in multiple marriages as a Christian. You're the husband of one wife. By the way, husband, not wife of one husband, husband of one wife. Again, this speaks to the gender. Sober-minded, you're clear-thinking. You're not all over the place. Re Self-controlled. Dude, you put me in an electronic store or a bookstore. How much control do I show? Yeah. So, <laughs> but you have to be self-controlled. You have to be respectable. Not just respect, you know, that your people respect you, but you are respectable to others. You treat people with respect. You're hospitable. How many of us guys are hospitable to other people? Okay. Able to teach. This is where I think where everybody goes, oh, that's where we need to figure. This guy can teach. That must make him a pastor. The ability to teach is not the same as being a pastor. Okay, if you can teach a subject and people understand it, that's great. But that's one aspect of being a, a, a preacher, a pastor, a bishop, an overseer. Not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. All of these things speaking to gratification of self. Not a lover of money. Manage your household well. Guys, how well do we do that sometimes? Are we willing to sacrifice our downtime to take care of our kids, to take care of our wives? Are we willing to lead and guide them? Or do we do devotions? Look, I, I, can, I can tell you the number of times how well I did that successfully. Not nearly enough, okay? Um, have, are we leading our children to Christ? Are we teaching them the scriptures? Are we, teach, are we guiding them and correcting them? Because he, it says we have to keep our kids submissive when we do it with dignity. We're not be browbeating them. We're not to provoke our children to wrath, right? We're not browbeating them into obedience. We're leading them and guiding them and correcting them firmly if necessary. But we don't, we're, we're not tyrants in our home. Uh, you can't be a recent convert. I hate to tell you this, guys. A lot of us come to faith. We read about six chapters of the Bible. We think we're experts and we can go preach. No. <laughs> and by the way, this isn't be a young per meaning a young person. Timothy was young, according to Paul. He says, don't let anybody despise you for your youth. But he was not young in the faith. He had been brought up in the faith. He came to faith young. He had grown for years in the faith before he was uh, made a pastor. And he was to be thought well of by outsiders. Again, if you got a reputation as somebody who's angry, you got a, a reputation of somebody who's just, I'm always right and you're going to do it my way, you're not qualified. 
If you struggle with lust, if you struggle with pride, if you struggle with anger, if you struggle with covetousness, these are things that disqualify you. This is a high standard for a position of someone who's of low estate because you are a servant. You are the chief servant. Going back to it, I think I said this before, John MacArthur in the 2019 Shepherds Conference talked about, the, and I wish I could remember the passage, I should have gone back and checked it, that he was referring to. He talked about the term for this, this uh, for the, uh, the pastor as being the, the, the Greek term used for a, at the lowest level galley slave in a ship. Like you're at the bottom rowing the ship. Like the, the people up there who have no idea who you are. That's the type of servant you are. Dutiful, slave to Christ, and just rowing that ship. You are that kind of servant. Which, Rich, this is why when people get upset and say, you're denying women, the, you're, you're, you're putting this glass ceiling in their way and they can't break through. This isn't a ceiling. This is the basement. This is the lowest dungeon basement where you're serving. It's this, we've elevated this to something that God did not intend it to be. But these are the standards. This is why when Paul gives instructions to men, and he says things like, love your wife as Christ loved the church, that, he, and gave himself for it. That is death to self. When you are someone like a Joel Osteen who elevates himself way above everybody else and talks about, just do what I do and your life is going to be fantastic. My wife and I, we do these things and God just blesses us. He, he sets himself up as the example. It's a death to self. These qualifications, by the way, guys, if you're never a pastor, but you strive for this and you live this way, you are the most humble, most God-honoring, pointing to Christ person that anybody will know. This is a lowering of oneself and elevating God. It is a lowering oneself and pointing to Christ. And so anyone who tries to enter in and say, No, no, this, this needs to be fair. They have stopped looking at that position as a signpost to Christ. And they've looked at that position as a place of honor for themselves. And I don't care if you're a man or a woman. The moment you look at that as a position to be seen, as a position to lead, as a position to have people hear you, you've completely misunderstood the position. You've misunderstood the role. And that's why so many people want to argue about this and go, well, that that's just a cultural thing and the ignore the creation part and and it's 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 the glass ceiling and it's 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 no this is the humble role of a man who's been called to be the lowest servant pointing to his master so that others may follow the master and that goes back to creation. What, it, what was Adam there to do? To take dominion over the earth for the sake of God. To give glory to God. He was to lead his life for the glory of God. Lead his wife. He was to lead his children for the glory of God. The wife was to come alongside, support her husband for the glory of God. They were to lead their children for the glory of God. All of this is so that God is elevated and his bride, his, you know, the, the, the bride of Christ, his people, are his precious jewel that he has cleaned and redeemed for his own glory. This is humility. This is saying God is more important than what I want. God is more important than what I think I deserve. God is more important than anybody else's perception of me or of that role. Everything about this is a lowering of oneself. Please understand that. Anything that elevates that position is something that has to be achieved so that people see the greatness. Completely misunderstand the purpose and point of the role. Now, Rich, with all that in mind, let's have you go through this. There's a lot here. So, folks, buckle up. There's a lot here. 
Rich, go through the, the what was going on in Ephesus. What we just learned. Remember, this is about humility and glorifying God, dying to self, submitting to God. Rich, let him have it. Okay. Okay, brother. Well, kind of going back to last week a little bit, I've noticed one thing about these men and women wanting an egalitarian type church and trying to say, well, look at these women in the Bible. They show examples of this, this, or this. I think a lot of times they, they fail to realize Paul, Paul knew the Old Testament. They act like Paul never read these passages. And a lot of times it comes across like they think First Timothy was just yanked out of the air, mm -hmm. just kind of an abstract thought that just he just you know wrote this letter to Timothy, and it has no meaning or no application or no cross reference to anywhere else in Scripture. But um, I find it interesting what Paul didn't instruct in the epistles is as important as what he did instruct. Having been taught at the feet of Gamaliel, Paul was not only well versed but an expert of the Old Testament, knowing of Deborah, Esther, and Huldah, who you mentioned last week. He knew and labored with Phoebe and, and Priscilla, yet Paul never compromised God's, God's word on the role of women. He never gave instructions on how women were to conduct themselves as overseers of the church. And in referencing in these passages and <laughs> other passages in Titus and in, in Ephesians, he used the masculine sense in in, re, in reverence in reference to men as overseers. He was speaking in the masculine sense when he referred to men in the qualifications and in his description and, and commands of how husbands were to conduct themselves at home. And he always used the female sense when speaking of wives. He made that distinction. He in in I'm not even going to attempt to butcher the Greek words for man and woman in, in the context of those verses. People can go look it up if they're interested. But he made that distinction. Nowhere did he ever say, okay, man, this is your qualifications to lead in the church. And okay, women, here are your qualifications to lead in the church. He never made two different sets of qualifications, and there's a reason for that. God never intended for women to take a leadership role in church, period. Um, and in, in this verse, why did Paul highlight these commands, these qualifications, these distinctions? Why did he emphasize this instead of the sexual immorality that was flourishing in the city of Ephesus? Well, he does address the sexual immorality of that area in Second Timothy and in the book of Ephesians. But it's really important to notice and distinguish the fact that Paul specifically addresses women, you are not to preach, you are not to lead, you are not to have authority over the man, or as the King James Version puts it, usurp the authority of man. Okay, and I posted this the other day and I had several responses, but Let's just get down to the nitty-gritty now. Why did Paul write this specific letter to Timothy? Speaking of 1 Timothy, why did Paul write this to Timothy? That, that's a portion of understanding Scripture that most times today is forgotten and overlooked when it comes to applying hermeneutics to a passage mm -hmm. or to a context or to the, a body, meaning the entire letter, because the entire letter has to be read. You can't pull out one verse and build an entire denomination around one verse, which we see happen all too often. So why did Paul write this to Timothy? Remember, why did he write this? Why did he, he spend so much time emphasizing these points about how women were to conduct themselves in church? Why did he spend so much time and emphasize so strongly that men are to lead and to pastor, to be overseers. This was not something new that he was telling Timothy. If you go back to the very first chapter of 1 Timothy, Paul says, I urge you as I urged you when I, as I urged you when I left for Macedonia, meaning 
this was another reminder to Timothy. You've got to be standing firm against these false doctrines coming into the church. I told you then, I'm reminding you now, I urge you, I strongly recommend you be doing this. Part of the false doctrines or some of the false doctrines entering the church were the Jewish teaching saying that you must obey the law of Moses because constantly throughout Paul's writings, he's, he's fighting against and addressing what doctrines these Jews were bringing in. But that was not the only false doctrine being brought into the church in Ephesus, and not only Ephesus, but in Corinth and in so many of the other churches that were planted by Paul throughout the Roman Empire. Remember that, that's critical. Now, in examining the wine, we need to first look at the cultural context of this message. What was going on in and around the city of Ephesus? And we need to remember, and I think this is also sadly forgotten, Timothy was the pastor of the church in Ephesus when this was written. He was a pastor of the church in Ephesus when Ephesians was written. This city was not some backwater village. And I'd like to add, too, that Timothy was with Paul those two years back in the book of Acts, in Acts 19, when Paul was there ministering and preaching. Timothy was there with him then. So this city of Ephesus was not some new place to Timothy. He was really, really well acquainted with the city of Ephesus. Okay. Now, Timothy was the pastor of the church in Ephesus when this was written, and this city was not some backwater village. Ephesus was like the New York City of Asia Minor in the New Testament era. Pliny once called it Lumen Asai, the light of Asia. In the first century, only Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch of Syria surpassed Ephesus in importance. Ephesus was located in now modern-day Turkey. It was the gateway between Asia and the Roman Empire. Ephesus was a major port in Asia Minor. The worship of the goddess Artemis dominated most facets of life in Ephesus during the time Timothy resided there. In Greek mythology, Artemis was the virgin daughter of Zeus and Leto and was originally known as the hunting goddess, although she later became associated with virginity and protection. Over time, the goddess worshipped at Ephesus took on distinctly Ephesian qualities and eventually became known as Artemis of the Ephesians. The famed Temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, lay just outside the city. This was partly due to the taking on, when it comes to it becoming known as Artemis of the Ephesians, part of that was because they started attributing to the goddess Artemis attributes of all these other goddesses in surrounding areas like in Asia, e Egypt, and throughout the Orient. Antipater of Sidon said that it surpassed the other wonders and that when he saw the house of Artemis, those other marvels lost their brilliancy. Artemis was more than just a primary deity worshipped in the city. Much of the city's immense wealth was tied to her cult. The treasury was in the temple, well, excuse me, the treasury in the temple of Artemis acted like a bank where everyone from the average citizen to rich businessmen deposited their money for safekeeping. The Artemisian bank eventually controlled the finances for much of that part of the world. It was originally built by Croesus, the Lydian king of Sardis in, five, in 560 B.C., and it was rebuilt after it was burned by a fame-seeking madman in 356 B.C. It was the first monumental building ever made of marble and was at one time the largest building in the Greek world. It measured 377 feet by 197 feet in size. The temple featured a cella or holy of holies that was 70 feet wide and open to the sky. A statue of the goddess Artemis stood behind a 20-foot square altar in the midst of the cella. It is noteworthy that the biblical descriptions of the worship of Artemis are affirmed by inscriptional evidence. The name Artemis of the Ephesians, chanted for hours by the fanatical crowd in Acts 1934, is widely attested in ancient writings. Indeed, the most common surname of the goddess in 
Pausinia's work is Artemis of the Ephesians. Another inscription describes Ephesus as greatest metropolis of Asia and the thrice-honored temple guardian of the venerable Ephesians. It uses the same Greek word, Neocorus, as the Bible does to describe Ephesus as the guardian of the temple of Artemis. The biblical description of the worship of Artemis in Ephesus during the time of Paul and Timothy is accurately reflected in the archaeological record. Being a port city, much trade was done in Ephesus, and the commercial marketplace was a bustling place. Scripture records that craftsmen who sold their wares there, like the silversmiths, brought in a lot of business and received a good income, Acts 19, 24, and 25. People would travel there from all over the known world to worship Artemis. And if one structure dominated the landscape in ancient Ephesus, it was the great theater. Built in the Hellenistic era as a Greek theater, it was later converted to a Roman theater during the reign of Claudius and Nero. The theater, the, excuse me, the theater could seat over 24,000 people. And keep in mind, if, if I remember correctly, Madison Square Garden sits about 20,000 people. But this theater could sit over 24,000 people with the top, topmost row of benches almost 100 feet in the air. It was the largest theater in the ancient world, and this is the theater where the crowd dragged the two men was, uh, that were with Paul yeah, when was, Paul was wanting to go in. Yeah, Gaius and Aristarchus, I think it is. Her, yeah, Aristarchus. Star, little, little, little. Yeah, <laughs> Aristarchus. <laughs> Visitors to this... Visitors to this wonders of the world have said, because the acoustics of the marble, a man could stand on the stage and speak and be heard in the highest seating. Just imagine the echo of the crowd screaming for hours. Like I said, this was not some backwater out of the way village. This was, as they put it, the New York City of Asia Minor. This was no small city, as Paul would, Paul, I don't remember if he said that, of Ephesus but he, he mentioned that of, of one of the cities, meaning that it was huge and important. Mm -hmm. It was vibrant. You know, the, the, it was a central focus of economy. Now, keeping the significance of the city in mind, let's look closely at the worship of Artemis, which was at the center of life for all the citizens of Ephesus. Paul would have encountered most, if not all, of the Roman gods worshipped throughout his travels in the Roman Empire. This would have included what is known as the mystery religions. They were considered mysteries because much of their ceremonial and worship practices were closely guarded secrets. James Legg, a scholarly historian and missionary in the 1800s, said concerning the mystery religions of this period that there had probably been no time in history of mankind when all classes were more given over to the thought of religion. Some of the great men of the past were members of the mystery cults. All these classes were found in their ranks, from the emperor and princes to the artesian, laborer, and slave. The outsiders held them in reverential awe. Anasides and the Attic Orator and Alcidiades, I know I, I probably mispronounced those. <laughs> the, it was put as the spoiled favorite of the Athenians were both implicated in and convicted of the serious charge of profaning the mysteries. These two men were great poets and philosophers in that time. Socrates himself was chided because he did not join the mystery cults. Alexander the Great scattered all of this throughout the Mediterranean world. The mysteries appealed to the emotions rather than to the intellect. Does that sound familiar, folks? It was Aristotle, who called attention to this. Now, keep that in mind. Aristotle said that these mysteries appeal to the emotions rather than to the intellect. They were a combination of a secret lodge and a playboy club, but blended with religion. Because they were secret orders, even to this day, we do not know a great deal about the rites that were performed in them. But of all the mystery religions, the worship practices of Artemis are the most recorded in history. Well, the worst of all the mysteries was the cult of Dionysus. Now, let me just say this right here. Um, there are links 
in our show notes to some of this material. I did not want to add most of what I came across because when Paul said it is shameful to even speak of what they do, he really meant it. And I have tried to be as tactful as possible from this point forward, but just keep in mind that it was depraved beyond imagination. And I was saying, while the worst of these mysteries was the cult of Dionysus, it was very prominent in areas to which Paul went in Asia Minor and Greece. Now keep in mind, Ephesus was in Asia Minor. It has been termed the crudest and most immoral of all the mysteries. Plato himself criticized it, saying, an immorality of drunkenness seemed to be considered the Dionysian reward for virtue. Women were in the majority in this cult, and the initiation was horrible. First, you would go through a ritual to make your application for membership. If you were accepted, you would be brought in for the initiation. A robe would, a robe would be put upon you, and you would, and you would be take, taken down into a pit. Above you would be a lattice work upon which a living bull was driven. As the bull was being slain, your head and garments would be saturated with its blood. You would lift up your face, letting the blood run into your eyes, ears, and nostrils, and then you would drink it. Then, before the bull died, the female members would make a rush for it, biting its flesh and eating it raw. And all of this would eventually end in a drunken orgy of the priestesses and those that were in attendance of this ritual ceremony. The mystery religion, which Paul came into contact more than any other, was known as the Great Mother, or as we know it, Artemis, and as other parts of that world called it, Sybil. This cult of the Great Mother, who loved the shepherd boy, Attis, is without doubt one of the most corrupt of all. It was very popular in the Roman Empire. The Ides of March that Caesar was warned against was a celebration of the Great Mother cult. On March 24th, there was a celebration of the Day of Blood. This day exceeded the Dionysian orgies in frenzy and barbarism. This day was also celebrated in Ephesus. The worship practices surrounding Artemis were much like that of Dionysus, but on steroids. And I will tell you, Ephesus would have been Eden for today's Christian feminist women, and you're about to learn why. Um, interesting side note, though. Ephesus is where the legend of the Amazonian tribes, the Amazonian women, come from. And there's actually some archaeological evidence that shows the, that the Amazons were real to agree with a, at one point in history in Ephesus, there was an all-women army that did nothing but protect the temple of Diana, or known in Ephesus as Artemis. And I just found that an interesting side fact that there was actually some historical basis for the legend of the Amazon women, but it was tied to Artemis, this one particular temple. Okay, going on. Only women, the priestesses, were allowed to teach and officiate the ceremonies and rituals in the city and temple. This was very loud, vocal, and involved debate. Some of the teaching involved medicine or magical arts, which were basically the same thing. Male, male members of the cult were, were taught these practices and how to worship Artemis plus other skills by these priestess women. Think back to when Paul talked about all the spell books being piled up that came to 50,000 pieces of silver and being burned. This, this would have been the books, the teachings, and things involved with the worship in the temple of Artemis. The people in and around Ephesus were accustomed to and expected women to teach, lead, and officiate religious ceremonies. It would have been a feminist utopia in that aspect and in sexual rights. Abortion and child sacrifices were part of the temple practice. According to some historians, the worshipers were encouraged to have multiple husbands seeking more daughters for the cults. Others have stated priestesses and women were encouraged to be perpetual virgins untouched by man. Um, there's other evidence that, that states that if a priestess had relations with her own husband before she could go back and serve at the temple, 
she had have to go through a ceremony that was the only way I know how to put it would be a virgin renewal type ceremony. She had to, to go through a process of being cleansed from having been touched by this filthy foul man and, and touched by him being in a biblical sense that she had to be purified before she could come back and, and serve at the feet of the goddess Artemis going on here. Um, but they were encouraged to be perpetual virgins untouched by man. And if you take that into account, both of these could possibly be true because if the priestess went through this virgin renewal ceremony, which I'm not going to go into the specifics because it is very gross and just bizarre, but that, 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 that the emphasis should be on perpetual virgin untouched by man but only man since Artemis was raped and it was defiling for a woman to be touched in the biblical sense by a man. Married women and that virgin renewal ceremony was a very common practice. Purity and closeness to Artemis was seen best expressed when woman was with woman. Sons were often sacrificed, left abandoned, or just killed. And this was the religion the women and men were saved from in Ephesus. The city was governed by men, but it was ruled by women. The high priestess had absolute say and rule since she was supposed to be Artemis in human form. Blaspheming Artemis brought a sentence of death. This power was greatly abused by the priestesses of the temple. Basically, it was do what I say or want, or I will accuse you of blasphemy. And think of the men... Think of those men again when the town clerk, when the when they were dragged into the theater, and think of what the town clerk said, and he spoke and made it clear they had not blasphemed their beloved goddess Artemis. Um, if they had been accused of blaspheming Artemis, they would have been immediately put to death. And even the Roman men and governing officials had to abide by this, thus says Artemis, since these women spoke for the goddess. Their magic words to get what they wanted were, Artemis desires. If it was something they wanted or, 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 or needed or thought they wanted, all they had to do was say Artemis desires and it would be handed over to them. And sadly, many times this also included children of the city or children of the priestesses or other children that were children of members of the temple of, of Artemis. And according to lesbian feminist historian, according to a le lesbian feminist historian, Antipride.com, Artemis is considered goddess of lesbians and those seeking purity as a woman. I also want to go on and, and point out that Ephesus was an exception to most of the Roman Empire and other cults because women, especially those serving the temple, had absolute control. Ephesus considered the female body perfection, where the worshippers of Zeus, such, such as in Crete, where Titus pastored, they considered the male body perfection. Most of Rome, and especially in Crete, patriarchy was the standard. In most cases, women were truly subjugated. And there was exceptions when it came to these mystery religions, which is why, which is one reason why so many women flocked to these mystery religions because most of these mystery religions were about elevating the female body, the female persona, the female goddesses. And like I said, most of Rome, especially in Crete, patriarchy was the standard. And in most cases, women were truly subjugated. But in Ephesus, Ephesus resembled more of a matriarchal type society. While many of these other cults who worshipped Roman gods and goddesses had women serving in the temples, only Artemis was exclusively female or female-ish. Keyword, female-ish. They were taught Artemis was the creator of man and superior because woman came first, then gave birth to man, and it was because of man's sin and suffering came into the world. Strangely, however, even with the domineering power and authority held by the women worshipped, by the women worship leaders, 
they were forbidden by imperial decree and in interfering with other religions or practices. So even though Artemis and, and the rule of Artemis and the rule of the priestesses was absolute and supreme, they were still forbidden by Roman decree and in interfering with other religions or other religious practices. Um, that was one of the strange things about the Roman Empire, the way they interacted with all the different religions and included all of them within the empire. And I wanted to point out, too, that the worship of Artemis was actually a state-sanctioned religion at the time of the New Testament. And I won't go off into what all that means, but basically it means it was an officially recognized religion of Rome that which gave them certain legal rights and advantages, just like I pointed out about the priestesses, and, and even they could condemn a governor of, of Ephesus. Um, many historians have tried to whitewash Artemis of the Ephesians and claim they worshipped a different goddess than the one spoke of in other cultures who describe in graphic detail the cult practices. The only problem is, no matter which name is used, they all point back to Phrygia and a meteorite believed to be a gift from the gods. Remember, I said femaleish. For a man to be a priest and serve in the temple, they had to castrate themselves during a ceremony in front of the priestesses in a ritual similar to the blood ritual mentioned earlier and similar to the virgin renewal ritual. Their ceremony emulated the renewing of virginity ceremony practiced by women in which they both. <clears throat> Okay, the, the, the virgin renewal ceremony and this ceremony bringing these, these men in as, as priests both involved the individuals being forced to nurse at the udders of a cow. Why, I don't know. I didn't go off into that, but that, that should tell you something right there. But anyway, this ceremony also involved blading a live bull. In order to be a priest at the temple, you had to become as much like a woman as possible. They considered womanhood absolute perfection, and only women could represent the great mother goddess Artemis. These men would dress as women and had to submit to women as a man would submit to another man in sexual relations. And this was not a metaphor. This was not metaphorically done, but literally done. Um, women priestesses were the authority following the high priests. The priests were allowed, though, to celebrate the day of blood. They would wear gold ear <clears throat> excuse me. They would wear gold earrings, dress like a woman from waist up. They, it was believed that they actually bleached their hair blonde, and they would weave in gold strands. They wore pearls and other gold jewelry, and were adorned in makeup. And this is also how the priestesses dressed during the temple, so, during the temple services, and how the women members dressed while attending these worship services. Wealth and excess meant great piety as worshippers of Artemis. During the parade, male priests were basically nude from the waist down to, bu to publicly display their submission to the goddess and priestesses while flogging their backs with a cattail-like whip. In modern terms, these men were transgender and were required to be such to serve at the temple and, and to be members of the Priest, priestesses of Artemis. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that people are starting to get a picture like I did, that, that we're looking at a completely depraved domination by women within this city. And these parades and practices would make one of today's gay pride parades look like a Puritan picnic. I'm not going to go into details, but um, I, I came across and read some information and different things I don't even want to go into, but like I said, there's a reason Paul said it's shameful to even speak of what they do. Um, some have even tried to whitewash the, the Ephesus ritual, saying that these men were not part of such practices, but there's a fact about the what's known as the cross-dressing golly reveal otherwise with their worshiping of a meteorite located in this region. Um, I, I won't go into the details about the golly, but um, just recall the town clerk mentioning the sacred stone falling from the sky, which they considered a gift from the god Jupiter. All these different references from some of these different cults in and around Ephesus all point back to this great stone that fell from the sky and the temple where this 
stone was located and it being a gift from the gods. And some cross-references, the Gali were actually these male priests of the Temple of Artemis who had undergone these acts to become as much like a woman as possible. Um, the Gali were actually rejected by many in other Roman territories because they supported what was opposite of known manly norms. Um, most exegetical commentaries, even ones I've read by John MacArthur, to me seem to miss the mark a bit on Paul's commands about women teaching and preaching in this verse. Um, a lot of the commentaries seem, seem to rely more heavily on the Jewish element. Um, they imply Jewish woman's newfound freedom in Christ, especially in reference to in reference to remaining silent and being taught in there with the men. They state these Jewish women were excited and overjoyed by these new freedoms, but there was a mix of Jews and Gentiles in this church, and both would have been very familiar with the cult practices around Artemis. And I think that's something that's far too often overlooked, is that in the church of Ephesus, more than likely you had more Gentiles than you had former Jews or you had Jews within that church. Look at how long and how much time Paul spent there and Timothy spent there. This was a very large, prominent Christian church in the in this city of Ephesus. And we need to remember that um, for the Roman women of Ephesus, they were the dominant power. Men governed the city, but the women had most of the wealth and power especially the priestesses of the temple. Culture was centered around this religion, and Ephesus was capital of the world for followers of Artemis since they protected the great stone, and this city is where it is said she and Attis rose from. And Attis is another Roman god deity type worshipped. Um, I'm not going to go into that. that. That would be another hour. But anyway... <laughs> Like in, like in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was separate from others. You remember God said he was going to create for himself a people separate from the others? But this new religion in Ephesus, this Christian religion, this, this religion of the way, would, not, would have not only been separate, but a direct contradiction to all they knew in regards to women's roles in ritual in religious ceremonies. It wasn't just the sexual rituals, eating raw flesh and blood ceremonies they came from, but in some aspects, they came out of what every Christian feminist is demanding today. They demand superiority. They demand to teach. They demand to preach. This is what these people came from. Um, when Paul made these commands about women teaching and exercising authority over men, this was not something new. He was denouncing the false doctrine that was prevalent within the city around them that they were saved out of. They were saved out of worship practices where women led and did all the teaching. And in one aspect, when Paul makes this statement, it's not only a statement to the women. He was rebuking the men in this church for allowing and participating and going along with these women teaching and preaching because this is not how God originally ordained things to go. This is not going back to Genesis once again. This is not the created order. And this portion of Scripture not only addresses what false doctrines and mysteries were invading the church of Ephesus, but stood in direct opposition to their former way of life. Also, this era for the Jews was being heavily influenced by the Hellenists, and some of the controversy of the Jews Paul mentioned in Acts was women's roles in the synagogues and how the Hellenist influence was changing, even in Jerusalem, was changing the views and the, and the role of women in the synagogues. Um, some modern-day scholars who support women preaching will acknowledge the commands from Paul regarding women's roles in churches and the limitations, but, cl but claim these limitations were only for the church in Ephesus and only for this era. But keep in mind, these letters were circulated throughout the Christian churches, and Paul told them to do this. And Paul basically states the same things 
to Titus, who was in Crete, who was in Crete and surrounded by a patriarchal way of life. And understanding both the meaning and the application of these verses also means a careful study of Acts 19, the book of Ephesians, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Now, to wrap this up as it applies to this verse, specific specifics of Artemis worship. And, and some of this was based on, and I'm going to butcher this, Ephesaka Xenophon of Ephesus, which was written 50 A.D., it was a book written by an Ephesian writer, poet, philosopher who was from Ephesus in 50, well, it was written in 50 AD. Um, some think that it was basically like a fictional novel. Some think, some think it was based on actual events, but cross-referencing and, and triple-referencing different historical aspects, it, it, it is very accurate in detailing some of the specifics of Artemis worship. It was broke down devotion, braided hairstyle with pearls, wealth showed piety. The women in Ephesus had been wearing elaborate braids and gold in their hair as acts of piety toward Artemis, the mother of life. This practice not only created an economic disparity, rich versus poor within the church community, it also perpetuated the myth that it was necessary to dress, to dress this way and appease Artemis and to be safe in childbearing. Um, that's not from the book. This is some commentary from another source that applies to all this. Um, for, today's, for today's application, like Chris said, this would mean that women would be moderate, would be modest, demonstrating godliness from the inner being and not flaunting wealth. Um, women led training women led the worship services and training others including the training of the, of the men included loud vocal debate during during the worship services of artemis there would be loud vocal debates where it was screaming and shouting within the temple during the worship services there was basically it was a lot of noise a lot of confusion a lot of arguments, a lot of debates, a lot of discussion going on. This was part of the normal worship practice of Artemis. And Chris, you, you covered this pretty good, and basically Paul's meaning and applications still apply today as it pertains to this. Now, this next section is something I found rather interesting because I'd never even heard of this before, but in the worship of Artemis, the way that they presented Artemis, women came first and were superior, but men brought evil. Artemis brought peace and purity. One of the many reasons Paul ended this portion, pointing back to Genesis, correcting man came first and woman sinned, plus explaining why God holds men responsible for the protection of women. Christ is head of the church, man is head of the woman, and woman is head of the children. That's God's ordained order. Instead of just addressing all these other issues, Christ just takes these pe these men and women in Ephesus who are now Christians. He he doesn't just point out all these little specific. He takes them straight back to Genesis and explains from the beginning this is what God intended. And one of the books I've read over the last couple of weeks was written by a lesbian and feminist historian, and at times she went to great lengths pointing out how Christianity throughout the Roman Empire, subjugated women under patriarchy and falsely denounced the freedoms women had within that culture. And, I'm, and this is a quote from the book. Women today should hope for the liberties they enjoyed during the Roman Empire and especially at, during the worship of Artemis in Ephesus. Now, Paul knew what went on during the Artemis worship and I, I really believe that's one reason he stated in, F, in Ephesians 5.12, for it is shameful to even speak of the things that they do in secret. I don't know about the listeners, brother, but I'm seeing a correlation to today's women preaching. If, and if it, was, if it was against God's design in pagan worship, how much more so for profession mm -hmm. Christians? The decree about women teaching and exercising authority over men was also a rebuke to the men who grew up with that norm going back again as i urged you when i was going to macedonia remain at ephesus 
taxes so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrines. Um, I may be overreaching, but I see a direct correlation between women preaching today and the women leading these worship services during the times of Artemis. It's like, okay, the church grew, these Christians grew, eventually about 200 years later, the Temple of Artemis was destroyed, which secular historians blame Christians and basically say they were evil for destroying this great temple and how beautiful it was. Um, as mad, the majesty of this temple as it was during this time, I, if I remember right, reading the only thing left standing now is like one column. Everything else has been completely destroyed other than some co recovered artifacts and recovered statues of Artemis, which look absolutely nothing like the typical Roman Greek statue that we think of with the woman with the gown looking with the bow and arrow. Um, the images of this particular Artemis of the Ephesians looks nothing whatsoever like that. But going back to this, 1 Timothy 1.3, this letter is a reminder to Timothy of what had been taught during their two years in Ephesus. Timothy was with him the entire time and left just before the mob grabbed them in and started shouting, Great is Artemis. Women preaching's origins are not in Scripture, but culture. Now, just like when Paul wrote the epistle, ultimately, the question comes down to where and who came up with the idea that women can preach. For 19 year, excuse me, for 1900 years of biblical history, like the truth about homosexuality, <laughs> women's roles were understood. Now, have some men twisted Scripture to suit their own agendas? Yes. Mm -hmm. But you know, regardless of how man twists scripture, it will never negate the eternal, the eternal truths laid forth by God. The feminists didn't even claim a new revelation from God like heretics do, but base it all solely on culture and the feminist movement, which actually started with the end of American slavery. The suffrage movement was born at that time, and it was stated women are not much better off than former slaves as the suffrage move, movement started to come forth. Some claim, and this is some objections to some of these things that I've laid forth tonight, but some claim, well, the truth evolved over time like it did with slavery. It eventually ended so as a prohibition of women being pastors and preaching. The, ter the church misinterpreted the passages about slavery just like the, with the passages about women preaching, but I'd like to point out that the Bible gave specific commands on how to treat a slave as a brother. It even Paul even stated, if you can legally be freed, do so. At no point in time does the Bible ever state or tell a woman, if you have the chance to dominate and rule over your husband, mm -hmm. or you have the chance or opportunity to be a leader of your church, to, to be the pastor of your church, do so. It never gives that. It does tell slaves, if you can be free, be free, but it never gives women a loophole or a clause to say that, well, if you can dominate your husband and dominate society, do so. No, the Bible is conclusive and, and fluid in that respect. It never departs from its own God-given means and meaning for the role of men, man and women in both church and home. It, and Feminism isn't about equality, but dominance, and especially sexual dominance, just like it was then, so it is now. Mm -hmm. So, brother, after all this, how did, how did we get to where we are today, and what have you noticed being said by some of these egalitarian feminists in today's world, and how does all this apply and, and tie together with last week's episode? Well, first off, folks, uh, give Rich some kudos for... That was a lot of research, a lot of research. And like Rich said, we'll be putting some of those um, links in the show notes. Obviously, he's got a lot more here that uh, some of this is, as he said, it gets pretty, can get pretty dark. So we'll, we'll, we'll not be putting those, although um, maybe if you want to reach out to us, we'll, we'll see what we can be, uh, be good about sharing that's maybe not really, yep. really bad, but... <laughs> uh -huh. Well, there's about 20 or 30 links and what, about 
a dozen to two dozen books, something like that. Yeah. So yeah. now, now, Rich put his scribe to work not, this week. <laughs> I did. I, I did not read literally read every one of those books, but at some point those books were referenced. So I just wanted to <laughs> clarify that. I, yeah. I, I can I can do pretty good at speed reading sometimes, but I couldn't knock out any twenty four books in two weeks. Yeah, no kidding, no kidding. So first and foremost, let me let's just again thank you for that research. You now see a bit of the backdrop. What what, what was going on in the city where Timothy was pastoring? And stop and think about that for a second. A, 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 a Rich, you pointed out this is like the Garden of Eden for feminism. Women who are not only having massive influence in the culture, but are the leaders of the main religious system and who can demand anything that they want. That is the backdrop. Now, Rich said it in, in his, uh, his historical um, backdrop there. A lot of people will try and say, well, see, that's why Paul wrote this and it was only for that. But we go back to what Paul said. He's telling Timothy, yes, this is, you know, it, it, I'm kind of expanding and maybe hypothetically explaining. Yes, this is what you're, the area that you're in. But it isn't just about what's going on in Ephesus. This goes back to creation. This goes back to the garden. This goes back to the roles of men and women as established by God back in the garden, back post-creation. And that men were called through Adam to lead the women in a equal role, a different role, but still equal to be the helpmeet to the man, which all reflects God's relationship with his people because it's a, it's a submission. It is this idea of husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So therefore, that self-sacrificial love, dying to self, serving and caring for, and in that leading, not ruling by tyranny, but rather humble servitude, that is what that leadership is, and wives saying, I submit to God in all that he's called me to, therefore I assume this role as the support and help me of my husband. And in that, that microcosm relationship of husband and wife is pictured in the church where the certain men are called to lead, yet all have a role to play within the body, all of which pictures the macro of Christ with the church. It is all about this submission, this humble obedience to the Lord. So that's what he's pointed back to, but using what's going on in emphasis, or excuse me, Ephesus, as the emphasis. This flipped on its head city that looks exactly like what happened in the fall in the garden, where the men have abdicated their role. The women have assumed an authority not that, that they are not entitled to, all in the worship of a false deity. There is a direct parallel to what we see today. You have people like Dr. Beth Allison Barr, who her pinned tweet is, isn't it time the church started fighting for who? Women rather than against women. She has elevated the person over Christ. She's not talking about submission. She's talking about elevation. She's talking about being lifted up and being seen. We just talked about the requirements for a person who desires the position of over or the role of overseer, bishop, preacher, pastor. It is the role of humble submission. Yet she sees it as a role of elevation. It is a direct slap in the face to the word of God, which calls for submission, but emulates what we see of the false religious cult in Ephesus. The elevation of women to the point that all must listen to. 
all must bow down to, all must emulate. There's when you when you have a situation where professing Christians say it is more important that I receive the position and the role that I desire rather than the submission to Christ that I must give. If you're going to do that, you're not going to teach the Word of God as it is clearly uh, taught from Genesis to Revelation. The moment you say, I, I want to uh, preach Christ, but I don't want to preach and obey what he says, then you're that's the first step off the path. The moment you say, I'm a follower of Christ, but I love the word of God, but I know this says, but you are now saying you are not submitting to God. You have become the authority. And that's where we see Dr. Barr and others beginning to eisegete that's importing into the text what is not there. And Rich, what we saw in Ephesus with this backdrop, this idea of we have this deity that we want to promote, that this deity that we want everybody to be pulled into uh, under our authority for, it is a rebellion against God and a, a promotion of a false deity and practices that have nothing to do with the gen genuine worship of God. And that's what we see here, this eisegetical importing worldly concepts into the scriptures. See, as Christians, we're to exegete the scripture. That's, In other words, we're to draw out what scripture says, what's contained therein through the through the deep study of the word, we're drawing that information out and we're applying it into our lives. We're learning what the writer was conveying to his intended audience. And we're, we're figuring out what did the writer say and how would the audience have understood it. That's what we're concerned with. We're drawing that information out. What does this actually mean? And then once I know what it means, how does it apply? So you have an intent, you have an actual interpretation. There's a single interpretation, and then there's application. So you're pulling from the text, understanding it, and then applying it in your life. Eisegesis is doing the opposite of that. Exegesis is attempting to seek the immediate context of the immediate text. It compares it to the broader text of the surrounding passage. It compares it to the book. It compares it to the your parallel text. It compares it to all of scripture. It's this laborious task so that we're not imposing our own opinions on the text. We're, we're, we're going through it like a fine tooth comb and finding out the, finding those beautiful spiritual nuggets that, that, Help us understand who God is and how we are to worship him and how we're to live according to it. But I said Jesus goes the opposite direction. It says, no, I want to put upon the text what I want it to say. It's bringing in preconceived notions, one's own opinions, biases, ideologies, and importing them upon the text. So rather than trying to understand what scripture commands of women or men or anyone else, but in this case, for example, women, the practice would then decide that equality must mean this. Therefore, we apply that to the text. And that's Dr. Barr. Dr. Barr says we have to elevate women. We have to work in support of women. We have to promote women. Rather than saying, what is, what is Paul saying here about women? Well, Paul says women are, are to learn. Paul says that that their profession of godliness is is what comes out from their heart in the in the form of how they of what they do in submission to God it is this desire to love the lord and submit to god rather than what's outward of, of appearance in dr barr's estimation it's the outward that it's the appearance of being able to stand at the pulpit and preach. But Paul says it's the inward profession that comes out through God, works of godliness, which would mean submission to God and his commandments. And the very next, hey, verse, the very next verses tell us how that works. Yes. Um, taking what she said and applying it to this age and era 
certain in Ephesus and what was going on around Paul and Timothy. Could you imagine Paul telling the congregation or Timothy telling the congregation, okay, you've got to come out from this false religion. You've got to come out from these false doctrines. Be separate, and you're going to have to denounce the superiority and, and the religious rule of women. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to give up all of this wealth, all of this power, all of this control, and submit to Christ. Yeah. Without without Christ, could you imagine within that society, much less today's society, without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, without Christ truly being there, could you imagine these women in their flesh being willing to mm-hmm. give up this type of control and power and influence that these women, and there were indications that some of the Christian women in this church were former priestesses. Mm-hmm who served at this temple. Could you imagine Paul telling him, okay, you can come be a member of my church, but you're going to have to give up all this wealth and power. It'd be like someone telling Elon Musk, okay, you can join our little church over here, but you're going to have to give away all the billions Mm -hmm. upon billions of dollars you have and live like a homeless man being mistreated every day in order to be a member of my church. Would it not be equal to that? It, I think it would be almost exactly like that. And, he, and here's the thing to think about. When we hear, and, and, and you cited some of this, when we hear people say, this was about power and control, this was about trying to get women su- to submit to men, could you imagine planting a church anywhere like Ephesus where that was like the most impossible place to actually accomplish that? They want to say, well, the, 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 the temple was torn down because of Christians. Imagine anything other than the power of God just, just taking a bunch of men who had no strength of their own, going into the place where all you had to say was, and we saw an evidence of this because they nearly had a riot, and the, the clerk had to come out and said, stop before the Romans come and kill us all. <laughs> you know, they nearly had a riot because they, nobody was really sure what really happened, but there was maybe an allegation of blasphemy. And there's this massive, almost riot. And you want to tell me, well, this was, this was about power and control. That's the worst place in the world you would have tried to do that. How could anybody, apart from the power of Christ, the Holy Spirit indwelling, hope to change that kind of environment? The only way you could ever have seen Ephesus overturned, apart from an invasion by an overwhelming military force, would have had to have been something supernatural. And that's exactly what you're getting at, Rich. You had men and women compelled by the power of God through the Holy Spirit, through the preaching of the gospel, through the word, submitting to something completely foreign to what was going on in that city. How? Supernatural power of Holy Spirit, transformation, new hearts, the power of the gospel at work in the lives of sinners, completely transforming them. Men and women in that culture who are now glommed to something completely foreign to that culture. There's only one explanation. That's the power of God. And yet we have people like Dr. Barr who would say it's about power and control. And now we need to reverse the effect and kind of make it like Ephesus was. We have to understand that scripture is not to be understood from a grammatical historical context, but rather we're to understand that of any passage that appears to restrict the roles of women is really because it's about power and control. And we have to reinterpret that to, uh, through, well, God wants equality as defined by the writer, speaker, Dr. Barr, or somebody else, not by the scriptures. So we've, re, we've, we've imposed a new form of interpretation that has nothing to do with what Paul said, what the people of Ephesus would have understood. 
in context of the scriptures, in context of the history of that area. Rather, we're to interpret passages because, well, the, the biblical author was a misogynist. And we know the scripture's really not inerrant anyway because there's contradictions. And because if God is about equality and Paul wrote about restricting women, well, this just evidence that Bible's really not inerrant. And so we need to, we need to import something outside the text in. Hey, brother. Yeah. Now that you said that, I'd like to add this real quick. Mm -hmm. The comment about Paul was a misogynist. If Paul had truly been a misogynist, he would have been adhering and sticking very, very tightly to the teachings of the Pharisees, who were the most strict adherents, mm -hmm. who, who, who adhered the most strict to the Old Testament to, to the Mosaic way of life. They would not in any way, form, shape, or fashion been on board with this new Hellenist movement allowing, wanting to allow women to have more roles in a synagogue. They would have been dead set on those old traditional ways where it kept men and women separated during worship mm -hmm. services, where women had their private own separate prayer rooms, where the men had their separate prayer rooms, where women were not allowed to be in the presence of the men during a worship service. If Paul had truly been misogynistic in his preaching and in, in, in what he taught, he would have stuck mm -hmm. to what the Pharisees truly believed. And like I said in, in the uh, earlier segment, Paul was taught at the feet of Gamaliel, who was renowned, who would have been considered the most brilliant, the most knowledgeable teacher in all of Israel for that time. For us, it had been, well, not necessarily everyone that listens to this episode, but it'd be like me and you sitting at the feet of John MacArthur and R.C. Mm -hmm. Sproul at the same time, yeah. being taught about Scripture for years, because back then, Paul wouldn't have attended the school of Gamaliel for a year or two. When it says he sat at the feet of him, it literally meant he and several other men sat there day in and day out for years upon years being taught by this renowned teacher. Yeah. And going back to the earlier book of Acts, where Paul was so determined to put down these evil Christian people that are all of a sudden rising up and speaking against the law and speaking against Moses and saying this, this Christ, this Jesus person was actually the Messiah. And remember that at one time Saul, or, or as we know him, Paul, stood there watching over the garments of the men mm -hmm. who stoned Stephen to death. That's how much of a strict adherence to the Pharisees Paul was. Yeah. And yet he was transformed by Christ himself. And Paul is the one that brought this teaching out that went across the Roman Empire proclaiming the gospel, teaching the men and women. And that would have been completely contrary to what he had been taught his entire life as well. I, I think sometimes we underestimate just exactly what it meant for Paul to have been saved in Christ. Oh, yeah. And, and the, the Saul versus the Paul type persona that he had when his old self and his new self were in complete contradiction. Um, Paul would have still adhered to some of the Old Testament and the Jewish rites and rituals, but not enough because the Jews were constantly wanting to kill Paul. Um, the thing is, when it comes to what was said by Paul and Timothy in Ephesus, I think in, in, in many ways what they were teaching and preaching these people in Ephesus that, that God's made with hands are not really God's, and, and stating that no man was created first, and these worshipers of Artemis were saying no woman was created first, and it's because of man sin and suffering came into the world. Well, the Bible completely contradicted that, saying no, because of woman sin and suffering came into the world. Yeah. Even though, you know, Adam is blamed for allowing sin and suffering to come into the world because of his failure to guard his mate, to guard his helper, 
to watch out and protect her. And I made a comment on one of the someone's posts the other day, and the comment came back, and this person was supposedly a, a woman and, and a Christian, and saying, "Well, I don't need protection. I don't need some man for blah blah blah." And I didn't even read the rest of it, but it still goes back to disobedience to yeah. the Word of God. How can anyone? And I don't care whether it applies to women preaching, um, sexual immorality, compulsive stealing, compulsive lying, or whatever. First John makes it clear, if a person makes a practice of sinning, they are not in Christ. Amen. Part of Christ on teaching said, if you love me, then you will obey my commandments. They want Christ as Savior, but they do not want, I mean, they want Jesus as Savior, but they do not want Christ as Lord of their lives. They do not want to submit to Christ, but yet they want to be saved and go to heaven. Exactly. Let, let me let me just we're we're running long here. I want to finish this up real quick, but I would just want to address something you pointed out about Paul as you know when people say, well, he was a misogynist, or you know this is you know this is all about um, misogyny. This is about you know controlling women. Let, let let's start with the going back to First Corinthians about the you know, a commandment that he gives with regard to women in the church. In verses 26 through 40, Paul gives instructions of what's to how things are to look within the church service, talking about you know uh, prayer and and revelation and tongue or interpretation. The, you know, if there's a tongue, let two only two at the most, maybe three, and then let someone interpret. Uh, but if no one interpret, then you you know no tongues, right? Um, Two or two, only two or three perfect speeds. Let everyone else be quiet and weigh what's said. Uh, if there's a revelation to be given, let the first person be silent. You know, so let one person be silent while the other one's speaking. Things done in decency and good order, because he says, "For God in verse thirty-three, for God is not a god of confusion, but of peace." So he's he's giving instructions to the entire church about how you're to behave, how the actions are to be, and then he says in verse thirty-four. The women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. So, here we have the order and structure of the church. It's not that women aren't allowed to talk at all. You have to be quiet. You never can say anything. But rather, in the church service, people stepping up to speak, thus says the Lord, only certain persons allowed, and women having a role within the church, no. No. But people want to say it's misogynistic, but he says, if there's anything to desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's shameful for a woman to speak in church. In other words, they're there learning with the rest of the church. That's not the, what Saul the Pharisee would have allowed, but they're there learning. And if they need to, to engage further, talk to your husbands, whom, in whom you are submission to, as in submission to the Lord. What does he then say in verse 36? Or was it from you... That the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? He's kind of telling the whole church, if you're not willing to submit to this as a church, are what what you think the Bible, the, the word of God comes from you? You're speaking out against God if you're not willing to submit to him and to his authority and for his structure within the church. But let me go one other place. Titus chapter 2. He's giving instructions to men and women within the church. Older men are to be sober-minded. Verse 2, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith and love and in steadfastness. Older women are likewise to be reverent and in good behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. So both being given instructions about good behavior, godly behavior within the church. They are, women, sticking with verse 3, they are to teach what is good, and so train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Let me stop right there. Women have a role to teach within the church. They have a specific audience, the younger women, but women have a role to teach. That's not Saul the Pharisee. That would have never been allowed. This is Paul the Christian. Women in the church learning. Women in the church teaching. Within the roles God's given. And then he says in verse 6, Likewise, 
The younger men are to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects, model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, and so forth. He's giving instructions hey, that all have positions with, and roles within the church with certain authority and certain tasks to do. This is not misogynistic. This is just saying, God, when we submit to God, we are submitting to his structure, his design for the church. Go ahead, brother. Well, it just, you, something you said reminded me of something I read, and I, honestly, I can't remember exactly who it came from. For some reason, I was thinking it was J. Vernon McGee <laughs> talking about an old-timey pastor out of Texas. Had a the pastor had a woman come to him once and, and told the pastor, I think I'm being, I, I think I feel like I'm being called to preach. And the pastor asked the woman if she had any children, and she said yes. And he asked her, how many children do you have? And she said five. He said, well, see there, God's already gave you a congregation. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is, is that it's not that you aren't permitted at all. It's that I, I'm not a pastor. I can't go stand up in front of the church and take my pastor's spot. He'd give me a swift kick in the booty where he belongs, <laughs> and I'd be, <laughs> I'd be back in the seat looking stupid because I'm not called to be up there. They let me, you know, they are gracious and allow me to do the podcast. They know what we do. And so they, they that that's a role that the Lord has allowed me to have, has allowed Rich to have. But we don't get to take the pastor's spot. We have our roles. And yet, when Dr. Barr says, I can't support a theology that blank, or others that say the same thing, they're, they're saying that it's their predetermined filter, which is not drawn from the text, is what determined uh, the, 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 the thought theology must say. Their predetermined filter. It's not a submission to God. It's not a submission to his word it's a, and his structure and design for the church. No, no. The way I read the Bible is through my filter. It's a practice that determines that mankind and not God is the far, final arbiter of truth. The thing that's interesting is if you're not blocked by Dr. Barr, and thankfully things like Google incognito mode and having an alternative <laughs> a Twitter account like the VRR account does allow me to at least review some of her responses. When people challenged her, if you remember, we talked about her her post last week about I, I cannot support a theology that, you know, basically doesn't promote women to the pastorate. People who challenged her, she pointed me, read, read, read my book or read this book on this subject. She's, she's saying the, not to go straight to the word, which is what some people try to get her to do. Rather, go to my book, which explains how you're not understanding the Bible right. Now, she did say that we need to appeal to people, or she did make an appeal that we need to read people who have different views. Now, in and of itself, that's not a problem. If you want to read Dr. Barr's book so you understand how feminist mindset is in, in infiltrating scripture, or, or the understanding of scripture, go for it. I, I got zero problem with that. It, it can, we can actually be benefited from reading widely to understand how other people uh, are interacting with a, a topic, understanding their arguments. There's nothing wrong with doing that. The problem is, is that we, it's not the differing views themselves that are the standard. Okay, some of the context that I the comments I sometimes get from people are, well, you just need to read people who don't see things the way you do. Okay, I don't have a problem with reading what other people have said. If if I did, I would not have read that migraine-inducing um, white fragility book. Oh, that was a tar tough book. If I had a problem with the idea of reading something that somebody else had written, I wouldn't do it at all. I'd tell people don't do it, and that, that would be very foolish. The problem is, is that they're not telling you to read because understand how my how, what argument I'm making so you interact with it intelligently. They're saying, read it because that's an authority. That authority is higher than yours. You need to submit to that authority. The issue isn't what other people have read. It's not what other, or, or excuse me, what other people have written or what I have written or what Rich has said or what I have said or what Dr. Barr says. The issue is, what does scripture in of, it, of itself say? Scripture is the, 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 the plumb line. 
Scripture is the authority. Everything that I say, that Rich says, that Dr. Barr says, that James White says, that John MacArthur says, that R.C. Sproul once said when he was here, has to be examined in light of Scripture. Scripture is the final authority. And if there's any quick contradiction between a person's view in the Bible, it's not the Bible that has to change. It's not our understanding of the Bible that has to change. It is us. If I find a problem where I read Scripture and I go, I can't agree with that, guess who has to change? Me. God is the final arbiter of truth, not me. Not Dr. Barr, not John MacArthur, not R.C. Sproul, not Rich. God is the final arbiter of truth. So, why did we do all this? And Why did we go long? Oh my goodness, almost two hours. I'm so sorry, folks. Um, what, what did... Wh why do we go through all this? Because when you see somebody like a Dr. Barr, what they're trying to do is unhitch the standard of truth from Scripture and replace it with their view or with somebody else's truth. They're trying to say that th what they are saying and not Scripture is superior. In the end, what those of the camp of Dr. Barr and others are doing, it goes back to the very question that Eve was confronted with in the garden. Has God really said? It always goes back to that. When someone comes to you and says, no, but the Bible doesn't mean that. They are emulating the serpent. They are saying, has God really, really said that? Are you sure you understood that right? Here, why don't you read this many books on the topic of critical theory or psychology or intersectionality? Or how about you read this, this feminist ideology? How would you, you, you look at our modern understanding of these issues so you can understand the Bible rightly? That's the, that's the sat, uh, serpent in the garden. That's Satan saying, oh, God didn't really say that. What he's actually said is he's denying you something. Folks, Genesis to Revelation is, all, all, is everything we have as is, is direct revelation from God. And it's the only revelation from God, contrary to what somebody who got very upset with me on Twitter today for saying people like Benny Hinn and <laughs> Kenneth Copeland are false teachers. It's the only revelation from God. And it is the final authority by which you as a Christian must weigh everything, including your own thoughts. Don't be manipulated by the emotional police. Dr. Barr is not like a raging lunatic, um, like Antifa type screaming at you on the street. She's an intelligent person. When you look at how she's written her tweets, she speaks intelligently. She owns her own mistakes of how she, we talked about it last week. Well, I, I you know, I was a bit too flippant. I was, I was being dismissive. I was trying to respond jokingly and it was coming across bad. I'm sorry. She comes across as intelligent. She comes across as personable. She comes across as somebody, wow, you know, maybe I need to, th I don't, I don't want to call this person uh, 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 who claims to be a Christian, a, a, a terrible sinner. I, I, I don't want to do that. But if you don't at least challenge what she's saying with the words of God in context, then you're allowing yourself to be manipulated. I have nothing but respect for someone like Dr. Barr who will say, hey, I handled this wrong. I respect that. But I cannot respect what she says when she says she knows better than the Bible. And that's what she's doing. And I can't respect anybody who will come to me who will say, you need to understand this ideology before you read scripture. Because you're saying you know more than God. And that is the height of arrogance. That is the height of pride. And that is the center of all sin. Don't be manipulated. Know your word. Know the word of God front to back. Read it in context. Do yourself even favor. Maybe don't read all the crazy dark stuff that poor Rich had to go through this week, but understand some of the history of it. One of the big mistakes I even make is we don't think about where history, the, the, you know, is the history books reveal what happened throughout these various ages and epochs, how scripture matches up at those certain points and what was going on. 
man, you want to know the context of what the, the church in Ephesus was going uh, dealing with? Read the history of Ephesus. You're going to go, wow, that really opens my eyes to some things. People who do sound exegesis are doing that. People like Dr. Barr aren't quite as concerned about the message and how it applied in that place at that time as, boy, it sure sounds mean today. And I've got this new feminist theory of history, so let me apply it this way. And I don't mean that to demean her, That's but that's what's going on. So thank you for spending two hours with us. I didn't know we were going to go this long. I'm so sorry. Uh, probably should have made this part three. Um, but hopefully this encourages you. Number one, it's not to encourage you to go beat down on everybody who said, well, women should be preachers. This is not for you to win an argument. Hopefully what this does is it encourages you to know that you can trust Scripture in its, in its totality. And that what, now you know how to interact with that argument. When so, what you recognize what's being done. That something else is being imported and you're being told to change your understanding of God's word to fit a modern theory, which really isn't all that different from an old theory and an old uh, false religion and an old false teaching and an old, an old cult. Nothing new under the sun, right? Satan has a certain brag of tricks. He just brings them out and changes them up every so often. Stand firm in the Word of God. Respond with the Word of God. Respond with the Gospel. Pray for people like Dr. Barr. Pray for her students because they're being manipulated to believe something that isn't true. And then go out and proclaim the Gospel to people and know that it's the power of God into salvation. And when they engage you, you engage with Scripture. Hopefully that has equipped you to do that. We hope that we've accomplished that in these last two shows. Rich, any last thoughts before we let everybody go? Well, I'll, I'll leave people with this with this thought. Progressivism is nothing but re regression back to the old original sins. Anything I've come across, especially in today's world, when they talk about being a progressive Christian, all they're doing is trying to embrace old sins that the Bible condemns. Yep. That's all it is. Amen. And as I close out, I'd like to wish all of our listeners Merry Christmas and thank them for having joined us throughout this year. Um, like Chris said, we're going to try to get in one more episode before we go into 2023. But in the meantime, whatever you do, make it a point to proclaim the biblical way of salvation at least once a day. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. We love you guys. We're grateful for you. Enjoy the time with your churches and with your family in the coming week. We will drop uh, a, a previous episode for you. Um, hopefully it'll be a blessing to you. And again, we ask you to share that. If this has been helpful to you, share it with others. That's all we can ask you to do. And uh, more than anything, pray for us, pray for this program, pray for our families who have to deal with us. Um, and uh, pray that we would continue to be faithful to God and that we would Use whatever platform he's given us for his glory and hopefully for your edification. God bless you guys. Good night. We will see you next time. Mm -hmm.